tonight on The Breakdown. Bryn Hall beams in from Christchurch after his team kick-started their season with a win in Super Rugby Aotearoa. Rugby Australia chairman Hamish McLennan opens up about the change underway across the ditch as the countdown begins for Super Rugby in Oz. Plus, the chance to win big with our two degrees game-changer moments picked by our usual suspects. Don't go anywhere. Kia ora, hello and welcome to the breakdown. Yes, Super Rugby Aotearoa invaded Hamilton and Wellington over the weekend. And of course it rained and it was windy, but we had two teams that were on the road that came out victorious. So John Kerwin, Mills Muliaina. JK, after the weekend, have we got two clear favourites for this competition already? Not just one, I'm thinking two maybe. Yeah, of course we've got one. <laughs> <laughs> Those the, the blues, Crusaders? <laughs> blues tinted glasses, Mills. Hey, listen, just give game. us, please, just give all of us Blues fans just this little moment. You had your moment last pre, week. Pre you COVID, moment last we week. were on fire, we were winning it. Post, we've gone down to the Chiefs, and I'm talking we, all of us from Auckland, have gone down there and come home with the bacon. How good is that? Let us enjoy it. They're talking about Blues players as the next All Blacks, Hoskins, Satutu. For example, which this normally happens to the Crusaders, right? How good is it? Are you done? Sorry. Are you done, Mills? Uh, I look at the weekend and we saw the Crusaders in action for the very first time and it didn't look as though they'd missed much in the time off. Oh, absolutely. And how dare we forget them that first week. We were back here thinking, you know, they had the bye and then they come out and you, you would have thought, you know, slow start, having to adapt to some of the new stuff and, and having to sit back and watch, but... They're the Crusaders of old, and that's why they're, they're in the champions in, in yesteryear. But you've got to hand well, handle it. You do realise, Mills, there are three undefeated teams in this competition. Oh, Highlanders. The Highlanders. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And they're coming north to take on the Blues, with probably with nothing to lose this, coming north. Look, anyone who would sit here in this chair and say there's a favourite is kidding around. I mean, this is the Crusaders we're talking about. Hurricanes, a little bit off colour at the moment. Highlanders have had a win. The Blues are showing some form, but this is not over. Yeah. I mean, the Highlanders coming up here on the weekend, for me, is a bit of a banana skin. It's a hard game of football. Haven't been thinking about it. Coming off two wins. So this is not over. This is the hardest competition in the world, and the only competition in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reality is, the reality is, this is New Zealand rugby, Aotearoa, and it's not going to stop. And you don't get a week off, and you can take nothing for granted. And Bernie, your Chiefs, though, <laughs> your favourite Chiefs are finding it tough at the moment, and it hasn't got any easier now. Absolutely, absolutely. They were beaten by a better team. I thought we were mates. Do you have to keep talking about it? Look, two-thirds of the Barrett brother trio are in triage. The Canes were without Geordie at the weekend, and the Crusaders, they were missing Scott. Seems, though, that Scott's foot injury is pretty serious, with another scan required on the 26-year-old's damaged hoof with a dodgy tendon. Now, Scott Robertson's expecting to make a call on his captain on Friday, and in his words, to see if he's going to be here for Super Rugby Aotearoa. It's ominous signs, isn't it? And as Luke Jacobson, possibly the unluckiest man in rugby. A fractured hand in the Chiefs game against the Blues on Saturday sees him sitting out the rest of the competition. Hugely frustrating and also unlikely to return Tom Robinson. Add the Blues Lucy to the casualty count after a meniscus tear. He's undergone knee surgery. We're only week three. Coming up to it. Also playing no part in his country's super rugby comp, Kirtley Beale. Just two weeks from the start of Aussie's revamp competition, or even less, he's called it quits. Not for good, though. The 31-year-old is ditching his Waratahs contract early to take up a two-year deal with French club Racing 92. He's one of Australia's great servants, isn't he? Having played 162 Super Rugby matches, 92 tests for the Wallabies, and he clocked up three Rugby World Cups. Well, in a world where we seem to upsize absolutely everything, is bigger always better? Is there a place for a standalone franchise or is there merit in the idea of mega franchises which have been touted? Now the idea is to merge professional sports clubs with a single organisation running a stable of teams across multiple codes. It already happens overseas with FC Barcelona which runs football and basketball teams so better together or better apart. Now, hold all tickets. Hold them. That's all some people can do after failing to get refunds on matches, match tickets bought through Ticket Rocket. Now, in fact, the Hurricanes, 
They have called the police. They are owned hundreds of thousands of dollars. Leading based businessman Matthew Davy, he runs the ticket outfit. He's also a major shareholder in the Highlanders. Now, the Landers and the Crusaders, they have used Ticket Rocket, uh, formerly known as Ticket Direct. They've now severed all ties with the company. Parting ways too, Mark Hammett with the Highlanders. The assistant coach, he's been with the franchise for four years now and he'll finish up at the end of this season. Now, familiar with the name Marquette King, he's a specialist punter who's played for the Oakland Raiders and the Denver Broncos and he's made a pretty bold statement tweeting, if I played rugby, I would dominate it easily. That's a big call, isn't it? Never poke the bear, Marquette. The All Blacks, they've invited him to attend training any time. I wonder if you'll take them up on that. Uh, former All Blacks, Jerome Kano, Lima Sapuanga, they've had a crack on social media as well. They issued a challenge, no pads, and a suggestion that maybe Ani Savia may make a great training partner. You've got to wonder, though, uh, this guy, what part of rugby does he think he'd dominate? He's a kicker. He's 87 kgs, ringing wet is my guess. He doesn't realise, I don't think, that even our kickers take the hits right. So number one in white is this guy Marquette King. Tickling technique, probably not high up there on the list of all time tickle, tackles. Yeah, coat hanger. He's pretty happy with himself though. One on one with Artie, would you back him? Not sure. Images of Andrew Merton's trying to tackle. It makes well, I, I recognise both of those tackle techniques. <laughs> As you do, JK. Ten, ten weeks he'd get. So come ten, down, ten. tackle like that. Then. Ten weeks He's for a red card. Big right? call, though. Big call. I'd love to see him come to a training. I think I'll tell you what I'd love to this. see. Backs wearing American football pants. You tried this. You were talking before the show that you and. you put your yeah, hands up. Yeah, their pants, the tights. Backs would look great in those. And you couldn't <laughs> tackle people with your yeah, shorts. Yeah, not sure that'll fly, JK. Mills, your thoughts? No, I'm on, mate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This has taken an awkward turn. <laughs> I tell you what, I mean, I look, I look at it, Mills, though. Reality is that if I was going to run someone at him, it'd be Nani Lamapi, just to see. You know, once, and I wouldn't want to tackle it, uh, that either. But when you're talking about taking on rugby union after the NFL, seriously? Oh, man, especially when you go out there and you're a, you're a punter. It's a little bit different if you're a running back or a wide receiver and things like that. But... Good on him. Good on him for putting you down there. I hope he comes down. One thing he will dominate is the pay packet because he'll be taking a massive cut if he's in time to play <laughs> rugby compared to anything. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Well, he needs the opportunity, let's be honest. He needs the opportunity to play. We've invited him to come down. We've invited him on the show. We haven't heard from him. I'll tell you what, someone who would probably easily give him a yellow card, it's Bryce Lawrence, who is the National Referees Manager. And, of course... Bryce, this is a massive opportunity, this competition, Super Rugby Aotearoa. We've had a couple of weekends now. You guys are obviously in constant communication. Where are you guys at right now in regards to how things have gone? Yeah, look, it's, um, it's been a good start. Um, we're seeing changes week to week. Um, some positives that we've seen are the, in week one, the average penalty count was 30, and in week two, it was down to 25. We're getting some really good movement and player buy-in around things like offside lines and space. So we're actually starting to see some really good attack. We saw that on Sunday with the Crusaders and Hurricanes, you know, moving the ball really nicely over multiple phases. And, um, you know, we're cleaning some of the areas up that we've uh, been asked to do, like side entry and sealing off and things. And there's still a couple of areas that are a bit of a work in progress. Bryce, uh, these... Directors, these, they're not changes in law. This is the application of the law. These are something that have come from players, coaches, obviously from World Rugby. Everyone has been involved in this process and they know exactly what is expected of them right now, don't they? Yeah, it's really been led by World Rugby, but also really the leading international coaches in the world. Ian Foster, Eddie Jones, Joe Smith, those type of guys. They're the ones that are driving it. And then World Rugby have listened to the coaches and the players and I've asked the referees to um, try and be more referring to the law that currently exists. So it's no new law. They're just asking referees to actually referee the laws that are already there rather than go out and create all these new laws, which I don't think any of us wanted. Um, and some of it's been really successful so far, and some of it players are taking a little while to adjust, and the referees are taking a little while to adjust. But we're constantly talking with coaches and, you know, at our review meeting in the week, Last yesterday, sorry, we had Ian Foster on for half an hour talking to the refs over a range of clips where he didn't think we were getting it quite right. 
And what the real positive for me was the clips that he identified were exactly the clips that, as a referee group, we had identified. So it's it's working well. Bryce, do you feel you're you're allowing the referees to be themselves during the game? That's one of the challenges, uh, JK. You're right because um, we're asking them to do a little bit things a little bit differently and be more technical, and then that's driving some change in behaviour by them as they're adjusting, because they've only had one game each. So it's going to take a little while. And they're saying that it's feeling a bit awkward and not overly natural. Um, so I'm really confident that by the time they do two or three games and build into their campaign, that they'll get better and better. Um, and they're saying it's feeling a little bit unnatural at the moment. And I suppose most change processes probably feel a bit unnatural. Talking to some of the leading players, Sam Kane and James Lynchies and things like that, they're really positive about what World Rugby's trying to do. And they're just saying it's going to take a little bit, to, bit of time for players and referees to adjust. And we're putting our hand up and saying, look, there's a couple of areas that we're not quite getting right at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I've asked that question because it felt, and I think, uh, you know, Ben is one of our world's best referees, but it felt like he was trying too hard in the first half and in the second half he just riffed what he was seeing and it looks, looks so much better. So how are we going to find that balance? Because, you know, it's getting better, but the amount of penalties is frustrating for the players and for the spectators. Yeah, look, I think the way we're going to see some improvement, hopefully, JK, is the decisions that we're not quite getting right at the moment, and there's two of them, one is... When do we reward the jackler or the man over the ball lifting? And we're a little bit quick giving him the penalty at the moment. So that's going against the ball carrying or the attacking team, and that's stopping flow. And then we're just not getting the arriving player cleaning out a tackler, driving him off the ball. We're not quite getting that technical picture right. And once again, those penalties go against the ball carrying or the attack team. So if we can tweak those two areas... And they're the ones that the coaches are coming back and sharing clips and our refs are discussing weekly. And they're the ones that Fozzie's showing us. I think we might see a slightly different game, a bit more attack. And look, the refs want that just as much as you do, mate. Bryce, I'm interested that you said you, know, you want you guys to adapt and things like that. I mean, and also the referees to adapt. Are we going to get a little bit... Are you saying we're going to get a little bit of leniency towards sort of the, the ruck area and, and, and rewarding sort of the attacking players rather than looking at the defensive side? Look, I don't know if leniency is the word, Mills, but we're definitely going to work hard on those two areas that I've just spoken about. Um, and we've just had to create some better clarity in our minds and start seeing some better pictures. And we worked hard on that yesterday. The Super Rugby coaches and the refs have been sharing clips last night and again today. I think we'll be better this week, we'll be better the week after. Um, and once we get those pictures right, uh, we're going to see more attack and I think a better flow. And I I'm realistic to know that it takes a little bit of time and the players are adjusting. They're working really hard. The coaches are working extremely hard. Take my hat off to those guys. They've been awesome. And the refs are, are working really hard. But... You know, we're close, but we're not at our best at the moment. Uh, Bryce, I, I know there are always ways that coaches are going to continue to try and challenge you. And, and on the weekend, um, trying to find ways to protect possession. And one of the trends in the game used to be the squeeze ball. And Dalton Papali'i on the weekend against, um, uh, against the Chiefs, he got himself in a position where he felt he was legal. What, what's, what's going to be the attitude towards that? And particularly in this circumstance where he went body first and then the ball was only presented once it was put through... Uh, and squeeze between the legs. That's the clip that we had a long talk about yesterday. And uh, we believe our decision was wrong. So Dalton was immediately on the ball, so he's got all rights. He showed clear release, so he's got all rights. The Chiefs chose to squeeze ball, so he couldn't get the ball and lift like he's meant to. So we believe he should have been rewarded either with the penalty or if not the penalty, let him then go forward and then pick it up the second time. We had a long discussion about that clip. Uh, we're having to work out what the squeeze ball means again because it hasn't been in play for a couple of years. Um, but all the teams are using it to protect the ball. And um, we had a great discussion and then Fozzie came in with exactly that clip and um, reconfirmed our thinking. So hopefully we've got that um, a little bit clearer. 
Yeah, well, and, um, you're taking so ownership for everything, which is great, Bryce. And, and uh, I like the fact today, and we knew you were coming on the show, of course, we had a conversation, but you sent through a couple of clips that maybe you guys have looked at and decided, you know, once again, you need to make adjustments and tweaks. And this is around that much uh, contested area around the breakdown. Yeah, well, just two clips of, uh, you know, penalties going against the ball carrying team, which are just too technical. So Alex cleans out with good shape but then tackles Damien, and that's the picture we see. So that should be play on. And then James Parsons cleans the guy out, but goes off his feet. And we've all agreed that if you clean a player out and leave your feet, as long as it's not dangerous, it's play on. So we didn't get those pictures quite right in week one and two. And the clips that we looked at yesterday, Leon McDonald and Tom Coventry sent them through to us. We had already identified them. So we knew that they were clips that were of high interest. We fed back to the Blues and all the super teams on Monday night those clips and said, look, guys, here's a couple. We put our hand up and say, we've, we've, we've got to improve in this area and um, both those decisions going forward will be looking to referee differently. Bryce, I believe in self-policing. I believe that professional sports, coaches and players have been guilty. All of us have been guilty on the table. We will push the laws. So some self-policing, we mentioned last week about three penalties going against one team should be a yellow card. But I guess you can put that forward to Fozzie and whoever else is, is involved. But my question is, why are we waiting so long for the yellow cards? You know, if we're a bit stronger a bit early on it, you know, at second half when the game's really in the balance and it's a bit undecided, the yellow cards are coming out. You can see the frustration in the ref. So why don't we just go a bit earlier and set the tone for yellow cards rather than wait till it's really critical late in the second half? Are you available to come on our review meeting next week? Any time, exactly Bryce, you know that? Any time. <laughs> that's exactly what we spoke about um, on Monday and something that I raised. Um, we, we're working hard on those trends. I don't think we're getting our timing absolutely right. Um, so we, we've had a discussion around that. Um, I think the teams are self-policing some areas. An example, 12 penalties in the first round for offside. Big emphasis by teams to practice and get better at that. Very noticeable. Seven penalties in week two. So referees still going hard on that area, and we're going to stick to that because space is vital, but teams self-policing better. The key is, when teams do infringe, are we getting our management timing right? And on one or two occasions, I agree with you, JK, we've been a couple of penalties late giving the warning and therefore a couple of penalties late giving the decision. So once again, um, we're on the same wavelength. We've just got to just tweak that a little bit. I get a feeling that he might be secretly coming in on your Zoom calls. That's what I think exactly what JK is. I have is. another He's question. Can I ask another question? He's coming in the sideline, but Bryce, I've got, to, I've got to thank you for your honesty. I know, and your time, you're at your mum and dad's, I know, there was probably a roast sitting on the table. Mate, appreciate it once again coming on the show and knowing that you guys are trying to contribute to the spectacle and game we're playing. Look forward to catching up soon. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, and say to dad. <laughs> I like Emil's... I... I like what I'm hearing, the fact that they're taking ownership. JK, you always talk about accountability. Is that something we're starting to see from the referees right now? Well, he's mentioned a couple of that. I think one thing that I did want to sort of try and clarify is the fact that he's mentioned Fozzie a heck of a lot, a lot in that conversation and where their alignment is um, with, the, with the Super Rugby coaches and because obviously he's, he's overseeing everything. So, But there's some promising stuff coming out of there. They're, they're actually learning and talking to the, to the players. Um, the coaches are sending in videos and... And I, I mentioned the word leniency, but he's obviously, you know, they're actually going to feel the game out, JK, like you've asked. Yeah, and look, I, transparency, I think it's really important getting Bryce on and not the referees, because often they're on the front line and they're doing a great job. You know, the transparency is important. We, we need to know what's going on. But there's one set of people that I'm trying to talk about. That's the fan. Yeah. Like, the fans are saying, what's that for? What's that for? What's that for? And that's what we need to do. Just make it a little bit clearer for everyone. If we're getting more clarity from the boss, which I think is great, and I look at what happened from week one to week two, there were changes, there were improvements. Statistically, like he said, all of a sudden we are seeing changes. So you look at those. All of the teams that have played both weeks have improved mills. So they know they have to have the conversations. This is not going to change in a hurry, but you're talking a reduction on, on average of there was five penalties less per game. If you're starting to see that, it was 21.7 when COVID hit. That was, that was the average number, 21.7 penalties a game. We're at 25 after all of these things that have been introduced. So 
and that's down from 29. So we're making progress, right? Yeah, we certainly are. And I like that the fact he brought up those cases, the fact, you know, that you, um, you guys are going over there cleaning, they're losing their feet, but there's been no Im impact uh, from the from the jackler going over. The jackler is, is a huge thing, that Dalton Papali uh, situation. The problem with that in the weekend, that could have had massive consequences because he was yellow carded. And so if they can get that right, then hopefully it won't have a massive bearing on the game. There's a couple of things I'd still like to see. I'd still like to see, and I think Steve Hansen spoke about it three years ago, a, a captain's challenge. Like right there, that's a mistake by the ref, not his fault. You know, he's just made a mistake like we all do. But it's a yellow card, Mills. If I was captain and saw that and could go upstairs or stop the game and say, challenge that, that changes the game. That completely changes. So I still think there's a couple of little things that we can do to just help a wee bit. The refs, like I said, it's not all their responsibility. The interesting thing being, though, on the side of that, though, we only had, on average, seven and a half scrums per game. So when you've got to weigh the balance of it up, if the sacrifices we are seeing less scrums but seeing more penalties, which way would you like to see it go? Well, we spoke about it from the very beginning. We didn't want scrum resets. I think you, there's still an element of the game that you've got to uh, try and, and hold on to, and, and that's the scrummaging, because that's a big part of, of, of dominating physically and the technique that goes into it. I think we've got a good balance at the moment. You know, it would be... The change will come when teams start to use that. You know, instead of going for the line, the line outs, they'll go to a scrum because they know that that's their strength. I mean, I absolutely hated rooming with them, but we don't want to see them out of our game. So Agreed. if there's only four or five scrums, and let's say that becomes a trend, we're not going to see the bigger gentlemen of our game. Did I say that right? Mostly the bigger guys in our game continue to be in our game. And that's important. Scrums is what makes us unique. Line outs are what makes us unique. We've got to keep that. Well, that's outside the lines and getting information about what's happening inside someone who was inside those lines on the weekend, their first game, the Crusaders. And Bryn Hall was a big part of that. And Bryn, thanks very much for joining us, mate. Looking nice and relaxed, nice and cruising. You're one from one. I want to talk to you straight away. As a first game, played under these interpretations, under this sort of refereeing, did you notice a difference in the game? Yeah, we did. I think we had a... 11 penalties in the first half. I know Ray was massive around, um, I guess, educating us as best as we could around trying to not give away penalties. And I think the common trend through the first two weeks was and um, we kind of fell into that trap and um, probably didn't get it right. And then the second half, we only had four penalties against us. So uh, you've just got to be on. And I think for us as well, it kind of actually felt a little bit like American football. Um, the intensity meters that we actually checked up on our GPSs were a lot more high than usual games because um, there's so many penalties, a lot of stoppages um, and behind intensity is right up there. So it was a little bit different. And, uh, but again, um, good to be back out there and, and get a W, especially in Wellington where we struggled in the past. For an awesome game, you guys, you know, a week off and just sort of came back humming. Great start. What sort of stuff What sort of stuff in particular that you're talking about um, in terms of what Razor said to focus on not getting penalised? Was it going off your feet, entry, or uh, all the jackal stuff? I think you guys had it right on the head that when it comes to the jackling. Um, there's been a, a little bit of a shift in what the interpretations are the law, and um, I guess not giving the jackler as much licence to get the ball in. Um, you've got to be squeaky clean to, to get the results, and I think I watched earlier in the competition with teams getting massive line breaks and then cleaning from the side and taking away that momentum. And uh, those are the biggest things that, that we saw. And uh, we actually had a few of those on the weekend where we had momentum and then we lost it just like that because we fall into the old traps that we have the last probably a decade with the rules. So, rule. so we've got to try to rectify that. And, um, you know, if we keep giving away penalties, we're just not going to get the momentum. So we'll continue to keep working to that and hopefully we get that done pretty quickly. Bryn, between you and TJ, there was actually three refs on the field. But <laughs> what, I, what I want to know from you is when we normally watch players, they will, they will be in, take an interpretation from the referee. Is, was that more difficult on the weekend, understanding what his trends were? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think for us personally, we've got... Um, Obviously, Cody was the captain, and, and you try and leave those kind of decisions to him. But I guess JK, you know, for me as well, mate, I like to have a little chirp here and there, and, and so does TJ as well. So uh, we try and uh, best educate the ref while we can. Um, but again, <laughs> it, comes, it, 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 come, it comes down to, um, to what their interpretation is, and they're always going to get it right. I know TJ's actually done that in the past where he's actually got it right with the ref, but um, it doesn't happen a lot. So 
you just got to try work with it and your captain can speak. But again, us halfbacks, mate, we think we know a few things. So um, <laughs> it might continue. We'll just have to wait and see. Brian, it was an impressive first up performance, though. And for you guys, immediately you would have done a review where you've looked at those parts of the game. How much better and how will you improve on the performance from the weekend? You'll have a Chiefs team that is coming to town that are going to be incredibly de desperate. Yeah, we're um, a massive understanding that, you know, the Chiefs are... Um, they could have been two and two, but they obviously had two little uh, two losses. And traditionally, we've struck them actually. And um, you know, the last two games that we've had against them, they've beaten us. And um, you know, we don't like losing, and we're just trying to get the the learnings that we have um, from those games. And I guess the last two games that we watched them play, and we know it's going to be a big a big encounter. It's the first time that we're going to get at home. And I know Hallers has actually come to the party with having ten dollars for adults and five dollars for kids as well. So. You know, we're hoping that we get to see the pitches like we did at Eden Park with our with our fans coming out and it's supporting. I wanted to, to see our fans and, you know, hopefully it can be chocolate for us to play the Chiefs come Sunday evening. Bryn, they are hurting and, you know, you've mentioned before how tough they are physically as well coming down there. What's your biggest focus this week against the Chiefs apart from staying on side? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think penalties is going to be a big one for us. I know how tough it is when... You give them away, well, what was it in the first half? We gave away 15 points with three penalties and our defence is really good and we continue to keep growing in, in that way and trying to defend really well. But I think the team that's going to best adapt to these penalties and not giving away a lot of penalties is going to give yourself in the best position to attack, which we always want to do. So no doubt Ray will be hard at us this weekend. You know, they've got great jacklers, Bushier, um, Karpik, and maybe Sam Cannibal might be back as well. So if we don't get that job done really well, um, we're going to be in for a long for a long evening of getting a lot of penalties against us. Bryn, lastly, look, you've been one of the most consistent performers in the Crusaders' output for a couple of years now. You've had a great couple of seasons. For you, what is it you need to do to take your game to the next level to get that next opportunity? Oh, it's, good. it's a good question, Goldie. Um, I think for me, mate, it's just been really consistent week in and week out. And I think with the very fortunate with, with our group that we've got a great halfback um, competition down down south. Um, Drummy's here and Eddie's been around for a long time with us, three, four years now. So um, you just can't afford to really um, think of those things too much because if you're, if you're thinking about high honours and trying to concentrate on that, you've got to get your job done at, at super level. So... All I can do is just try being consistent. I've got a few things that I'm trying to work on and um, you know, keep working with my coaches and how I can get better and how I can better the team and make us more successful. So um, if I play well and continue to keep doing that, then you know, hopefully those things take care of itself in the future. Well said, mate. Hey, thanks very much for joining us on the show. Look forward to seeing you down in Christchurch. And like you say, I'm sure the fans are going to pack it out at Orange Theory Stadium on the weekend. Thanks very much. And the audio left us. Um, look, I look at the Crusaders, JK, we look at the performance of them once again. Uh, they prepared well, they had the benefit of a week to have a look at what was going on, but they look dangerous. You know, they score a try in the very first 60 seconds, 90 seconds of the game, and I'm thinking, the Crusaders are back. It wasn't perfect, but I still think pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't think they went anywhere, did they? They just sort of put things on hold. And I've always said this, Mills, every individual's detail to the technique of our game is amazing. They yeah. clean out properly. They do those things well. I actually, no disrespect to the Hurricanes, but it felt like they were just hanging on mm. at times. So it'll be really interesting to see them week two. I think tactically for me, I looked at the Hurricanes and they were taking their threes. They were getting the advantage of penalties. Did they put enough pressure on when they had the benefit of territory, when they had the benefit of possession mills, did they go out there and did they try and beat the Crusaders or did they just in the end stay close and is that enough to beat a champion team? Well, I think just in the end they ended up staying close and trying to be, trying to be competitive in that way. I think initially they went out to try and, and throw the ball around. They showed some brilliant skills in terms of the offloading game. But when that didn't quite go to hand or your know, balls went down and things, I think they lost a little bit of confidence. And that's when you're playing against a team like the, the Crusaders that got so much experience, that's when they strangle you and they put points on you early. They put points on you when you, you least expect it. And so 
they're a little bit mixed at the moment, similar to the Chiefs. They don't quite, haven't quite adapted to the game plan they're wanting to play with. They want to play expansive or, or that, that sort of tight knit game. And at the moment, and that's when you're seeing, you know, the Crusaders and the Blues, the two dominant teams at the moment, they're the ones that adapted the best. Well, I think they did the right thing, Goldie. I disagree with what you said because when the Crusaders are on a roll and they're that perfect, or some of the, you've just got to hang in and hopefully it turns. And to be fair, late in the game, the Canes could have scored a try that would have put them under real pressure, knocked the ball on, didn't happen. But when they're on form, it's like the All Blacks. When the team plays the All Blacks, when the All Blacks are on form, you just got to hang in there. And if you can get three points, then you should. So I thought it was the right tactic, but it did feel like they were hanging on. Yeah, and, the and that just didn't change, the one right? thing they understand are big moments in games and about taking opportunities. And that is why, throughout Super Rugby Aotearoa, we're bringing you the Two Degrees Game Changer. You can win 12 months of Two Degrees Mobile and Broadband, a Samsung phone, plus a field replica Super Rugby jersey from your favourite team. Each week we'll show you two key moments. Let's look at the weekend's action. Well, Cruden went in and had another go, and Barrett with the drop kick! Over! Drop kick. Now they come blindside and space again. And rushing across was Proctor. Oh, he's fired it back. And it's going to be a try. It's a try to Richie Moonga. Yeah, head to Facebook. Dot com forward slash two degrees to vote and we will name the winner during the build up to the Blues and Highlanders match on Saturday of course that is at Eden Park you talk about performances, you talk about consistency I looked at the game in Hamilton, conditions were tough, challenging, we were there um, you were upstairs, you were nice and dry, we were gutsing <laughs> it out in the rain JK but I thought for me um, this Blues performance to back up what they'd done a week before, to travel down State Highway 1 and Given all your bluster at the top of the show, but these are games I think show a lot about the side. Yeah, I think they're really, and I hate using this word, they've got key talent across the park now that also has leadership. Patrick Tupolotu, for me, is just, in 12 months, just transformed himself, not only to a great player, we always knew that, but he's leading properly. You've got some real firepower so you can never relax. And that's what it felt like against the Chiefs. It felt like it was going to break in the Blues' favour. And I'm not being one-eyed about no, it. No, it just felt that they had this attacking right across the park. And that's what we're all seeing, Mills, right? And, and yes, we know Bowden Barrett has, has come to town and he's taking his opportunity. He's obviously having an impact. But they were doing this pre-COVID, right? Yeah. This is, this is a different outfit. They're talking about a different culture. They've got a different belief. I, I look at the way they have come together. They're playing with a level of confidence that I don't think I've seen out of the Blues for a long time. And a collective one as well. And, that, and that's what's so nice to see. I mean, yeah, this is a game in the conditions that, that, that we're on now, you know, sad day. And it needed a bit of just, uh, you know, rolling out your sleeves and things. And, you know, in the past, we haven't seen that from the Blues. They sort of shied away or, or sort of uh, lost, lost a bit of, um, you know, concentration. This was a team that knew they had a game plan. They knew that tackles, guys will, will, will fall off tackles. And you've got someone like Pecha Tupolotu that comes out and just explodes the leads from the front. And you've also got to give credit to that guy you're talking about, Bowden Barrett. You know, there's all the hurrah about him going away. But the way he's come back and led this team is outstanding. And this game for me, JK, was tailor-made for his sort of impact. The fact the skill set he has, the fact you're playing a lot of territory and you want to put your team in the right part of the ground, he was doing that. And his kicking game in those conditions was immaculate. And, and for me, it's that type of composure and leadership that they've been lacking. Yeah, I mean, that particular kick at the time, that banana kick or whatever it's called, Millsy, I can do the <laughs> kick, but... Well, not he, on purpose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he kicked it downfield. I know seeing his other kicking game here. But it went out on the five-yard mark. You know, that is a huge confidence. What might have happened last year is that the guy... And it goes out on the 50-yard mark. Yeah. I mean, this just changes the way you get your confidence. All of a sudden, you're up there, you can drive it. And I think the try came from that. So that's all building. And, and, you know, I think when you talk about what a champion is, you know, it's, it's talent meets character meets work rate. And what I was talking to some of the players after is they're doing the work off the field as well, with diets, with studying the opposition. So with Bowden, wherever he's going to play, 
They'll be hard to beat. Yeah, they will be hard to beat. They have been outstanding. We've got double passes to give away to both games this weekend. The game here in Auckland, that is the Highlander taking on the Blues. And down in Christchurch at Orange Theory Stadium, it is the Chiefs travelling south to take on the Crusaders. But here at Sky, we have another programme. Sky Sports presents The Pod. And I have no idea where this one is going to go. Justin Marshall catches up with Andrew Mertens. Um, the ball's come out, Ron Cribbs zipped off to the blind side. I'm thinking, I'm trying to run, I want to run the ball. Throw me the ball, I want to pass to these other guys. You've passed the ball to where I should have been for a drop goal. Had to get back a little bit and get it. At that stage, had no time to do anything. Just kicked it as hard as I could. Closed my eyes. There was a little bit of contact coming up, so I certainly closed my eyes and got out of the way, but I kicked it as hard as I could. And then I thought, I think that's going through. And I've run back, and in a, just a moment of child, childish, boyhood enthusiasm, I was only 28 <laughs> at the time, I pulled the double bird at the crowd. And it was really just a celebration. It was an exuberance. It wasn't meant to be that nasty. Welcome back to the breakdown. Yes, in 10 days time, across the Tasman, Super Rugby Australia kicks off. Hamish McLennan, is one of the bravest men I know. <laughs> he is the new chairman of Australian rugby. Thank you so much for coming us on the show. Look, first and foremost, um, what motivated you to want this responsibility to help lead Australian rugby forward? Look, I've never been afraid of a challenge and I've been watching from the sidelines for, for a long time and I was approached to join the board and then the more I got into it and I spoke to the board, I thought that, you know, with my skill set, what I've done in the past that I could help. And, you know, I just didn't want to be one of those people that was sort of bitching from the sidelines and, and not contributing at all. So I just thought, as they say, fortune favours the brave. You just got to jump in there. And I think the DNA of Australian rugby is actually pretty good. You know, our Queensland clubs are playing well. We've got to do a bit more work in New South Wales, but the Wallabies is a great brand. And we've got a fantastic history. So I played the game and I thought I got to jump in and jump in and help. So, Hamish, in your opinion, what has happened? So, 2003 World Cup, you put 70, 80 million in the bank. You win two World Cups. To, like you said, a little bit of bitching around the fringes now. You've just let your CEO go. It seems to be in turmoil. So, what do you think are some of the things that you need to do straight away? Well, this is, this is 10 years in the making. So... You know, I don't, I don't want to name names, but I think, you know, the administration's had some issues in the past. I think we've lost sight of grassroots rugby in this this country. And, uh, you know, my goal is to just settle it down, focus, the, you know, the money where we really need it, which is getting kids in schools to play again um, and invest in our talent. And, I you know, I think, I think we actually do have a bright future. We've got a big history. Uh, with the game. And, and the interesting thing, just since I've taken over in the last week or so, there have been a lot of people from all parts of society have said, what can we do to help? You know, we think rugby is a really important game to Australia um, relative to the AFL and the NRL. You know, you, you know, it's the only winter sport bar soccer, but, you know, mainstream sport where you can barrack for your country. And we've had a huge history with you guys. And, and everyone that I've spoken to, even if you if you barrack for an AFL team, they all want the Wallabies to go well. So I think the DNA is actually really good and we can, we can build on that over time. Hey, I just want to expand on that DNA. I mean, you talk about it, but the fact is, you know, your players have taken massive pay cuts. You're competing against numerous other sports in, in Australia. Are you, are you confident you're going to get those participation numbers back up? And, and what are you going to do to, to, to get those up? Yeah, good question. Look, I think we've lacked a strategy for a long time. Um, you know, even the school that I went to in Sydney, you know, we used to field 10 teams per year. We're down to two or three. So we're going to get... Mums feeling comfortable that their kids can play and not get injured, that they'll be fine. Um, invest back in grassroots rugby in the clubs, you know, which is really just where it all starts and getting people enthused around the game. So it's not an overnight turnaround that we're going to have. But, again, we've got some good young players. Our schoolboys are, are looking pretty good. Our under-20s, as you guys know, have shown some form. So the pipeline's stronger than I think a lot, a lot better than what a lot of people think. I think Dave Reddy's going to be a fantastic coach for us. I spoke to him this morning. I've had a few conversations with him. He's, um, he's a, you know, he's very calm. He's a grown up. Uh, I think, I think he'll <laughs> unlock something that team over time. So I am confident. You know, I think that we will start playing better. 
but um, but it will take time. So in regards to that then, so much discussion around the professional arm of the game and to us, of course, that is super rugby level. The Sanzar agreements, those um, partnerships that have been. How do you feel as though this partnership with New Zealand would benefit going forward? Look, when you talk to the broadcasters, we, we think if we are able to do something with New Zealand, that will be optimal. And everyone thinks that a cross-Tasman competition where we field proper teams, good teams with depth, will be the best way forward. So, you know, the pandemic's just taught us that, you know, you can't take anything for granted. So we're really committed at a Sanzar level. Uh, we want the TRC to continue. Um, but the realities are, you know, within our two countries, we've got a bubble. We're lucky compared to virtually everyone else in, in, around the world. So I think, I think the best competition from, from my perspective would be if we got something going with New Zealand, maybe throw in a Pacific Island team if that's at all doable um, and build from there. The tribalism and traditionalism, I, I reckon one of the greatest lessons in any other sport is actually how successful AFL has been. I've been talking to a couple yeah. of my Australian friends and they would rather see Manly Brothers, Ranwick playing instead of the Waratahs in Queensland and then maybe have that as some sort of, you know, showpiece like the, like, you know, the state of origin. I mean, do you think that has bolted and we've got to stay with the, with the franchise or we can go back to some club playing in a similar super competition? Yeah, 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 another great question. Look, we've, we haven't really invested in club rugby enough, um, but they're pathways through to playing super rugby and representative football. So we've got to, we've got to get those competitions right. I actually feel like there's, you know, if there's one part of the game, club rugby in, in sort of Sydney, New South Wales, Queensland is actually quite strong. So it's a matter of just getting that super rugby level sorted out. That's that's the thing that I think is broken. And I think the pandemic has actually just shown that you can't have games at two o'clock in the morning. The broadcasters don't like it. No one's watching it. Um, but but you know, if we can if we can play to you guys, that would be the best thing because you know you you're such a fantastic rugby nation. And then if we can get people out there um, playing against you guys, that would be great. How would you go then in terms of bringing harmony around the fact you've got, I suppose, five really strong rugby areas, the fact the Western Force are out on their own, but they're back into this super rugby competition. One of the questions for me will always be the fact, can you have the depth? Can you compete with New Zealand if you were to try and keep that width across those five teams? Because for us, that's what we're looking forward to. We want competition. We believe you have the talent. Yeah. But is it wide enough? Look, at the moment, I'd probably say uh, the depth quite isn't there, but we've got to try and build a competition for the long term. Uh, I'd, I'd consider opening more spots up to overseas players, so just depending on how things go through the COVID crisis, if, if there are international players that can come down and, and play a part of our competition with you guys, and I think that would add a lot of interest. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got to aim to build our depth and get better programs in place, get more kids playing over the long term, and that will, that will work and serve us well collectively over, over the long term. Hamish, you've, you've committed to 2027 in terms of a bid for the Rugby World Cup. New Zealand going to be uh, hosting some of those responsibilities? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, you, you guys... You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of history between two countries, our two countries. So I'm really open to that, you know, and I think, um, you know, if you supported us in that way, I'm very open to it. You know, if we can do more cross Tasman with Super Rugby, that's great. So, you know, I want to have a, a friendly and cooperative relationship with, with you guys. You are what you are. You're a fantastic rugby nation. But um, when it comes to the World Cup, I mean, as you would have seen, we've, we've put an advisory board together that's second to none. We're really keen to win it. We want to win it. And, uh, and if you got a few poor games or a poor, um, I, I'd be up for that. I'm sure we'd be up for it as well, given the fact we knew what we experienced the last time a Rugby World Cup was here. If you talk about support, though, and you talk about who you're putting together, do you feel as though if we get this partnership right, we can find a way to have a little bit more influence with world rugby? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Look, you know, the Sanzar nations have to stick together. Right. Um, you know, you guys have been the leaders over a long time. We've got a great history. 
the interactions that I've actually had with the guys in the north have, have been very productive in the short period of time I've been in the chair. So I think performance on the field really does go a long way in terms of making sure that we've got more influence. If we can secure the World Cup, that would just be great for our game in this part of the world. And it is due to come down to the Southern Hemisphere. So, you know, my understanding is that the Argentinians and the South Africans are, you know, notionally supporting our bid. So, you know, it'd be great for rugby in this part of the world. So we've, we've got to give it a real shot. Hey, Mish, look, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for giving some insight. Uh, I love some of your ideas. I'm sure those conversations you are going to have with New Zealand rugby going forward are going to give us some a clear direction. Mate, thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to chatting with you and Dave Rennie very, very soon. Thanks, mate. Pleasure. I don't know, guys. I really like what I'm hearing. Yeah. Uh, I like the confidence, good. the belief, bringing people together, JK, the right people to get a result. Yeah, look, and I firmly believe that Super Rugby, as it was pre-COVID, is dead. But how do we have a great competition keeping our South African brothers, including a, a Pacific Island team? Argentina, I reckon, are the biggest risk. What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to keep Sansa together, but form a competition that makes sense to everyone. Man, I'm excited about it, though, the fact that someone in Australian rugby has taken hold of that challenge there. We've got tickets to give away both games this weekend down in Christchurch, up here, and Auckland. Make sure you send an email to breakdown at sky.co.nz. Massive matchup happening down in Christchurch. You'd have to say the undefeated Crusaders will be up against a desperate chief side. <laughs> Welcome back to The Breakdown. Yes, it's time for the spotlight. We're going to pick a position. We're going to talk about it. And so much chat about Hoskins to Tutu. We're going to talk about number eight. Buck Shelford had plenty to say. He was in the paper today talking about how he thinks maybe we've changed the role. We've shifted flankers to number eight, uh, number eight and they're slightly different. If not, they have a significant different impact on the game. Mills, for you, when you think about the number eight position, what is it you'd like to see them to be able to do? Well, I think first and foremost, the hard stuff. You know, the, the stuff up, up front where you're hitting sort of bodies, you're cleaning out rucks, but also getting amongst the tackling, tackling stuff. When someone's coming around the corner, they're the guy that you don't want to sort of run into. The game has changed a bit. You know, we've got our number eight now, our systems have changed a bit, we're a little bit wider. So our finishing and our skill set for our number eights has all of a sudden become, you know, a back uh, mentality. So those, those are the big things for me, those three things. And I think at the moment, you'd have to say, Hoskins Tutu is doing all that, JK. Yeah, well, I'm not going to disagree with Buck. Hmm. Well, but no, he just does. does. Even if we did, we wouldn't yeah, say Yeah, exactly. It. We wouldn't say, Buck, with all the respect. But he's actually right. And I think if you're picking, if you were picking the All Blacks tomorrow, Hoskins Satuto is the best number eight in the country at the moment. I think that Artie Savir is amazing, but I always thought he was a loose forward helping us out playing number eight. And I think, like Mills said, number eight, you need, you need that person that is in a scrum, in his 22, that can get you over the advantage line. He's doing that like this all the time. He's a threat at line out. So if you miss a throw, he's going to take it. He can run with the ball. He probably should have given that that time. But look at that for a skills pass. That, I mean, that is copybook. And I know he's a young man and it's going to be difficult for him because now he's going to deal, have to deal with a bit of fame, us talking about him all the time, yep. keep working hard. But he is already, if I was, if I was picking right. my team, although Foxy would say to you, what? Uh, well, our team doesn't have to play. Exactly. But He'd be my number eight. Look, he's not the finished product. But I, I look at the role I want my number eight to play, and I think it's an impact player in the game. 
I want guys who are going to get you something that other players can't get, and that is getting over the advantage line, carrying the ball through contact, which is what Hoskins to Tutus did. If you look at last year's Rugby World Cup, between behind big forward packs, Billy Vunapola and Dwayne Vermeulen, two guys, physical beasts of men who with straight out power can get you over the advantage line, can carry strongly when there is nothing on. When your scrum's under pressure, they can do something. And I look at that for me as being critical. You've got other loose forwards who are specialists in other areas. For me, their impact on the game, the type of athleticism we're seeing, and it's not just him, the likes of... Um, uh, Marino Makaeli to down in the Highlanders as well. That type of player for me, Peter Gus Soakula, the impact they have on the game I think has to be significant. I, do, I wouldn't like to see the same type of player across all three positions, Mills. No, and that's probably the, the thing that sort of um, Artie was really good at, you know, and then when he was playing there, he was so good at every sort of at, at seven, six and eight that all of a sudden he's now lost in this sort of that position as where, where does he actually sort of fit? Um, and, and you're right, you know, guys coming off the back of the... Um, back of the scrum when they're going backwards. And when we first seen Artie do that um, for the Hurricanes when he was first shifted there at eight last year, gee, he was making some yardage. And so all our number eights are starting to do that. You know, when the, when the scrum's going backwards, the line-out board, they're being lifted as well. So all of a sudden, they become the line-out option as, uh, for the team as well. So that's fantastic too. Here's a question for you then. Does Hoskins need to play at six to be no. included in the All Blacks since all of our guys are playing all over the park now, Mills? No, I, I, think, I think to me, I look at him and he's an out now, number eight. He is a natural number eight and the impact he can have on the game. You're seeing all the skill set. To me, it reminds me of a Zin Zanbrook. I know those are big raps, but for me, they are there. Bernie, though, notice board time. What have we got coming up on the weekend? Absolutely. Well, we're celebrating and embracing the return of live sport here, but Aussie's about to launch its revamped Super Rugby competition. It'll make its official return on Friday the 3rd of July, just 10 days away. Suncorp Stadium, that's going to light up with the Reds and the Waratahs kicking things off. Here at home, though, we're about to hit round three of Super Rugby Aotearoa. Can you believe it? The Blues and the Highlanders at Eden Park, 6.30. And Sunday, always mighty clash, the Crusaders and the Chiefs. And we have three double passes to give away to both those matches, hit us up on the email and those tickets could be yours. Easy as. Come on, Burn. We're talking upsets right here. We are, aren't we? <laughs> Chiefs in Christchurch. The Highlanders coming to Auckland. We're coming for you, JK. Who do you think is going to win this weekend? I think Auckland will win in Auckland. They're the Blues. Yep. <laughs> and I think that... <laughs> yeah. Hang on, I haven't finished well, the We've got to go. We've got to go. I Quick. think you might be right. Are you? Blues. Blues. Yeah, yeah, I hate to say it. Come on, the Highlanders. <laughs> we will see you in seven days' time. <laughs>